welcome to a special edition of The Debrief. Just hours from now, the top 10 Democrats are set to take the stage, and we're here with our powerhouse political team, breaking down how the candidates are ramping up for tonight's high-stakes debate. We're live from inside the debate hall in Houston right now. I'm so excited. I'm Kimberly Brooks, and I'm here with Devin Dwyer. It's so good to see you and hey, be together. Hey, great to be on your show, Kimberly. This yes. is great. Yes. I feel like if anyone loves politics, this is where you need to be tonight. The whole political universe has con has descended on Houston, Texas today. It's pretty wild. People are uh, excited in the streets here. We've been talking to voters. A lot of interest in this debate. This is traditionally a Republican bastion, uh, but tonight <laughs> it's a Democratic spotlight uh, on the state of Texas, and I know that uh, you're excited to be here as well. A lot of people are going to be watching these 10 candidates. Tonight. Absolutely. We're getting fancy here. You guys can see this set behind us. It's beautiful. So, Devin, you've been here for a couple days, and I just want you to tell everyone everything that went into making this happen. This is this is incredible. Um, a, a beautiful set, Kimberly. When you came in, I know you were sort of awestruck by yes. this. This is actually 35 trailer truckloads of equipment. Look at this time-lapse video of how they've transformed the Texas Southern University uh, arena here over a number of days. 15,000 man hours of labor by construction crews and stage stagehands went into putting this all together. There's 115,000 pounds of hanging equipment. Look at those trellises uh, up above the seats there. And right behind me, you can see uh, a lot of empty seats right now. This is 3,500 empty chairs. Going to be a lot of guests here from the community, but also, of course, uh, from the candidates as well. Absolutely. And I think it's going to be so cool for the students who go to this university, Texas Southern University, to come in and see their university transformed in this way. Yeah, this is a really special moment uh, for Texas Southern University. The first debate on a historically black college or university campus. Uh, Texas Southern founded in 1949. Uh, the students here are proud of their school, but also proud of the fact that HBCUs uh, are getting a look tonight. Absolutely. So what I want to do is bring in our deputy political director, Mary Alice Parks, because she's going to break down what is happening on this stage tonight. So Mary Alice, what's Hi. up? Good to see this you. This is our Super Bowl. <laughs> Kimberly, you're here. I'm never with you guys, so I'm feeling all of the love. Um, so Mary I'm Alice, like right behind us. Yes. Ten stages, ten, ten podiums set for the stage tonight. Absolutely. Everything's bigger in Texas. Yes. And the stakes <laughs> feel bigger here in Houston, too. You know, these campaigns know that they have to sort of reset after Labor Day. It's only three and a half months till voting begins. And voters are keying in in a different way now that it's the fall and now that it's just one night of debating. Ten candidates, and that's it. One stage, one night. So we're excited to really turn a leaf in the campaign in some way. Now, we're going to be looking for how these candidates tend angle on these top issues. We've been talking about all week the fact that Joe Biden is next to Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. The first time they've shared a debate The first time that he's been with Elizabeth Warren. And they're flanked by these two progressives. Really that ideological divide front and center on the stage. I'm also really going to be looking closely at the two Texans in the race. Texas feels like it's at the center of every key issue. You know, we're only six weeks since that horrific domestic terrorist attack in El Paso. But but also climate change, health care, education, like you were talking Still about. Still recovering from Hurricane Harvey here. Yeah. A exactly. lot of talk about the impact of these storms. Exactly. Yeah. So it just feels really exciting to be in Texas. And I know those two Texans on the stage are going to try to make it personal. And there's going to be folks on the wings that will be following in a whole new way. They know they need a breakout moment. Amy Klobuchar has been sort of staggering in the polls, but she's a tough competitor, and so we'll be watching senators like her. What I want to know about is the people who aren't on the stage, because there's still some candidates out there that aren't going to make it here tonight. Some I know. of the moderates, right? Yes. I mean, this stage is, is a lot of the left-leaning part you, of this field. You're exactly right. There are senators, governors who have dropped out in the last few weeks because they didn't qualify. You know, we've been talking a lot about businessman Andrew Yang. He qualified even though so many of these sitting politicians didn't. And there's going to be a lot of pressure on these candidates that didn't make it to this debate to maybe bow out in the next few weeks. But there's another debate coming up in October where the qualifications are the same. So if they start to feel like they're getting close to qualifying for that October debate, well, they might just stick it out. Okay, so before you go, I just want to ask you guys, what does this moment mean for you? Because you guys are deep into the politics. <laughs> so this is like the Super Bowl, it's as like you said. Super Bowl. It it's is. so exciting, especially in a race like this one that has had such a sprawling field. It's been a busy summer. So many candidates, you know, a lot of the details on policy get lost. This feels like a pivotal moment, a turning point in this race when the field is obviously much smaller. We're starting to, voters, as Mary Alice said, starting to tune in now yeah. uh, after the summer. And 
and uh, we'll have to see if this changes anything. The, 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 the polling on this race has also been very uh, static. We've seen right. Joe Biden at the top, so we'll see if tonight this uh, shakes things up a bit. But personally, Mary Alice, personally <laughs> for Personally, you. it's nice to be, like, outside. <laughs> I've been buried in conference rooms working on some of those questions, thinking this all through. We put hours, weeks, weeks of research and thinking into making sure that it is a substantive conversation. That's the goal. And so I hope it plays out that way tonight. Awesome. Well, we're going to carry on. Uh, we have uh, Chris Donato, who's in the spin room, uh, where the candidates will go after they leave the debate stage. So, Chris, you're with us right now. Good to see you. Um, what's happening where you are? Hey, Kimberly, how are you? So once the candidates are done on stage uh, in the debate hall, they'll make their way here to the spin room. You can see it's a little empty right now. But come closer to the debate. It'll be filled with journalists. There are over 500 seats for journalists to come watch the debate, uh, write their articles, write their stories, do f their own fact checking. And then after the debate finishes, the candidates will make their way here and come spin, talk about their positions, t defend their, uh, their statements from the debate hall. And they'll just face a big scrum of media when they get here. And, and Chris, we know you're going to be part of that crowd in there. Tell us what it's like uh, as a political reporter to cover an event like this and to go into the spin room, chase down the candidates. Uh, this, is a, this is a big deal for all those political journalists um, and, and trying to make some news. Well, it's, it's a great time because, you know, it looks like a big room, but when you have the 500-plus journalists in here, when you have, you know, two, three, four, maybe even 10 candidates in here at a time, it gets very crowded. So you have layers of people just trying to get access to the candidates and candidates trying to respond and defend all their, uh, all their statements. So it's just a great time to be in here. It's a great way to uh, interact with the candidates and have access to candidates and ask them questions uh, that you're interested in that maybe they didn't get to talk about while on the debate stage or even uh, maybe they didn't get to talk about enough on the debate stage. So it's a great, to be a political journalist, it's great to be in the spin room and uh, interact and, with those and, candidates. And Chris, we know you're, you're, you're tracking how they're preparing as well. Give us, give us a flavor uh, of how uh, these guys are getting ready for the big night tonight. Well, each candidate has their own uh, way of preparing, you know, whether it's doing mock debates in a hotel conference room and meeting with advisors to go over their policies, or um, some of our colleagues were with Andrew Yang yesterday when he was playing basketball. That's his way of warming up. He posted on Twitter showing him playing basketball, showing him uh, boxing, showing him really doing a full workout. And he said he compares the, the debate hall to really a wrestling match. Uh, we saw uh, Congressman Beto O'Rourke playing the drums and just jamming out on the drums and loosening up that way. We've seen other candidates hit the campaign trail in the last couple days as their way of preparing. So each person has their own way to make sure they're ready for tonight. All right, Chris Donato, right there in the spin room. Um, so cool to see how everyone's prepping because this really is a mental and physical activity, wouldn't you say? Did you play the drums to prep for this show, Kimberly? <laughs> what were you doing this morning over there? I was Little hoops? kind of sleeping in, trying to get rested <laughs> up, you know what I'm saying? Um, so everyone's going to be watching tonight, but one person that everyone's trying to see um, about tuning in to this debate tonight is President Trump. He said he may watch, we're not sure, but we're hearing his campaign is planning to fly a massive banner over the campus. So I want to bring in Karen Travers at the White House. Um, Karen, good to see you. Who is behind this banner that's going to be flown over yeah. the campus tonight? Yeah, this is a clever little move of counter-programming, trying to get their message out over Houston, uh, that banner blasting socialism. The campaign, I think, is trying to get themselves in the headlines in any way they can. I mean, frankly, you see the banner right there. Socialism will kill Houston's economy, and of course, the push to get people signed up for alerts from the campaign. That is a very big grand gesture, a very visible gesture for people in the city of Houston. But 
you know, we all know what's probably going to happen tonight in 140 characters. It's going to be the president tuning in with some sort of real-time reaction. The president was asked yesterday, Kimberly and Devin, if he's going to be watching, and he said there's a chance he'll be watching. I think there is a near 100% chance he'll be tuning in for at least some of it. I was in Japan with the president in June. We were 12 hours ahead on the time zone. The president had a very busy day of world leader meetings, and yet he still found some time to watch a Democratic debate. He even, I think, kept Angela Merkel of Germany waiting a few minutes while he caught a glimpse on a TV, and he was very eager to tell reporters about it. He said there was a TV in the hallway, stopped for a second to tune in. So imagine him here at the White House tonight, settling in for a good night's debate. I think he will certainly be paying close attention. Hey, Karen, and the president not only likely to pay attention to this, but he's got his eye on something else over at the Supreme Court. Big a decision uh, late yesterday for him and his new immigration policy when it comes to asylum. Yeah, the president declaring this is a big victory, and it is a big win for the administration in the court. So the backstory on this is this summer, the administration put forward a new rule that would require asylum seekers to first seek asylum in another country, not the U.S., somewhere they pass through along the way. In effect, this would put restrictions on almost all migrants coming here from Central America. The Ninth Circuit last month said that this had to be put on hold. It was not going to go forward, and the administration asked the Supreme Court to allow allow it to be put in place, go into effect, while it was going through these legal challenges, because this is going to play out now for some time. That's what the Supreme Court said yesterday, that this can move forward while the court cases are being heard. So the administration, very pleased with it. But this is not the end of the story. This will likely end up back to the Supreme Court for the merits and substance of what the administration is trying to do. The ACLU says this is patently unlawful under U.S. law. You can seek asylum wherever you come to this country however you got here. And Karen, this likely to be a topic uh, the president will rally around when he meets with Republicans uh, up in Baltimore a little bit later today, headed out of the White House, also raising some eyebrows given things he said about Baltimore. He's been very critical of that city. So uh, we'll be, I know you're going to be watching what he, what he has to say about his visit there. Yeah, the president's going to be having dinner tonight and giving remarks to House Republicans. And it's the first time he's going to Baltimore since he blasted Baltimore this summer, calling it a disgusting rat and rodent infested place. He also said it's somewhere that no human being would want to live. So there were some eyebrows raised when the Republicans announced that their retreat was going to be in Baltimore, knowing that the president would likely make an appearance. Uh, we'll see what he says there tonight and if he continues those attacks on Democratic Congressman Elijah Cummings, who represents part of Baltimore City, who was one of the big focuses of the president during that summer feud during those hot days in July. All right, we have Karen Travers right there at the White House. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And Devin, um, one thing that I find so interesting, you've been here, but you've been working hard because you've been talking to everyone city, it feels like, and specifically uh, the students that go to this campus. I have been talking to so many of the incredible students at Texas Southern University. They are proud not only for the spotlight that is on their school, uh, but for what it's doing to highlight the importance of historically black colleges and universities in this country. Those schools, which have been vital to educating and uplifting so many generations of African Americans, have been struggling uh, the past uh, decade or so financially uh, and otherwise. But the students I talk to here said now more than ever, these HBCUs are important and relevant. As a saying at HBCUs, we have our entire life to be the minority. Here we actually get to be a majority and be represented, so it was really important to me. Both of my parents went to historically black colleges. Most of my family has gone to HBCUs, and so it was really important to me to also continue that legacy of going to a historically black college. Kira, is there something you get here that you don't get at... Texas State. Definitely, and I think my story is different from all four of them here, is I, from California, we don't have any HBCUs. Um, none of my family has been to an HBCU. I'm actually the first person to go to HBCUs. The nurturing spirit that you get here from faculty all the way down is something that you will not get at any other institution, in my opinion. Would you be surprised that since Donald Trump became president, there's been actually an uptick of students enrolling at HBCUs? A lot of people say maybe no accident. I'm not surprised by it at all. Uh, with so many uh, racial like tensions rising and that of that nature, I think students want to feel safe. So, of course, students are going to want to enroll in an institution where they don't feel like they have to fight for a safe space. Do you feel like when it comes to racism and discrimination, 
life experience, do you feel like it's getting worse? I think it's been more blatant these days. I feel like racism is going to always be something that we have to deal with because you can't change the way somebody thinks. We have dealt with these issues. Uh, they've been pressing us. They have oppressed us. We will continue to be oppressed because there hasn't been enough change for me to say that it's getting worse, but I can say that it hasn't gotten better. So safe to say you guys are all Democratic primary voters? I am more <laughs> liberal. I am more policy-based. One of my biggest things is gun control. So I'm looking at a candidate that will push strong gun policies, not more a party that's going to push an agenda. And that's an issue that a lot of individuals get wrong. In our current political atmosphere, there are more party affiliation than policy affiliation. Yeah. He's being followed right there. Especially in the wake of two mass shootings yes. last month in this state, a lot of people talking about gun control. What else is important to you guys? My main uh, issue is the criminalization of poverty and how we're seeing a shift in the the country's dependency on the prison system is really is really um, a key issue to me because I want to see a candidate that can try to push away from that. Kira, what are you hoping to hear? Some big things and key things that I'm really hoping to hear from people um, are we talking about um, funding for colleges and those type of things, but also like healthcare is not something that we take serious enough. And I, so I think that's definitely something I want to hear from candidates and their policies moving forward. Dr. Raquel Brown Burton, good yes. to see you. So, Thank you. what does it mean to have this debate on this campus and HBCU? How, how significant? extremely significant because a lot of people don't even know historically black colleges and universities exist. They don't understand or know the mission of our institutions and why they are even still relevant today. Some may argue that they are not needed or that they are not relevant, but I would strongly disagree. Yeah, we, we just heard the students talk right. about this is a place of refuge. It is, at it is. a time of a lot of racial tension. It is, it is, and it, it hasn't just been that way. It's been, for me personally, I don't think I would be here today if it weren't for the experiences and the exposure. You attended two, you've taught at three. What right. is it about HBCUs that you're so passionate about? It's a way for me to give back to the community, to the young people, because when I was a student, I had I wasn't sure of what I wanted to do. My ideas were limited, but by being in an environment where you were being exposed, great opportunities uh, that sometimes students of color don't receive unless they are at an HBCU. So really a neat opportunity, Kimberly, to spotlight uh, these uh, these incredible schools, uh, more than 100 of them still in the country right now, founded uh, back in the 40s. And we're joined now uh, by the president of Texas Southern University, Dr. Austin Lane. Thanks for having us uh, here on campus. Here. Thank you so much for being here and, and hope you're having a good stay here in Texas and most importantly at TSU. It, you guys Absolutely. have been so hospitable. You know, I want to ask you, start by asking you about what I heard from so many of your students about mm -hmm. the importance of these types of schools uh, right now. I heard the the word refuge a lot. Does yeah. that surprise you? Uh, not at all. You know, we do a really good job in making sure our students feel at home. Like most HBCUs, you'll hear students like you heard on the piece just now that are really connected. Uh, they feel appreciated. They feel like they have a voice. Uh, and they really uh, excel when they get here and go off to do great things. And so we're just excited that they get the opportunity to be here with ABC and to be in the mix and, and to really learn from the professionals like you. Yeah, what do you think they're going to feel when they walk through these doors and see their oh. their stage, their <laughs> well, campus transform? A few of them have already said, when you leave, we need to bring it back and have it for commencement. <laughs> I said, that's not going to happen. Just leave it So up. don't get spoiled. That's right. This is fantastic. When I came in yesterday, I was blown away. I couldn't believe it was still our gym. And our AD, he and I joked, we said, we got a lot of work to do uh, to make sure that we spruce it up a little bit once you, once you leave. So. I ask you again. Uh, you know, about the financial struggles mm -hmm. that a lot of schools, maybe not TSU, have experienced HBCUs in the past decade or so. Mm -hmm. How important is federal funding uh, to keeping these schools sustainable? F over $500 yeah. million, dollars, I understand, That's a right. year in the yes. federal budget for HBCUs. Extremely important. We just got back this week from the National Conference for HBCUs in D.C. Uh, the agenda, at least that I went up with, is how do we pull down more federal dollars from those departments?
governments, whether it's Department of Education, Defense, Transportation, you name it. And so how do we receive more of those dollars, those federal dollars in research and, and grants? And so that's our agenda. A lot of HBCUs have not been that successful in doing that. We, we have probably more than some others, but there's still more work to do. And a lot of the candidates we may hear tonight, given uh, where, where we are, have floated some pretty bold yes. plans of funding <laughs> for right. HBCUs. Yeah. Pete Buttigieg uh, talking about $25 billion, yeah. Elizabeth Warren $50 billion. Mm -hmm. What do you think of, uh, of those numbers when you hear them? Is that yeah. realistic? You know, I usually focus on the money and not the message, and, and then most importantly, the action. And so a lot, I know now, it's a lot of talk about, you know, what they'd like to do, and that sounds great, but we need that to translate into real dollars for our institutions. And so I, I typically don't get too excited when I hear that, yes. and I try to pause out a little bit and just make sure that they really understand the need that exists for HBCUs and, most importantly, Texas Southern. What else are you hoping to see on this stage tonight? You know, I'm, I'm hoping to uh, really see some, some real good dialogue between the, the candidates and that, that they really understand the issues that impact our students most importantly and then our community, uh, not only here in Houston but across the country, across the world. And so I'm hoping to really see that. We have to be nonpartisan, so I have to sit back and not get too excited or, you know, leaning left or right. But I am excited that it is here and, and uh, this. This venue is just phenomenal to have that kind of discussion. We've, we've heard so much from the students the past few days, uh, Dr. Lane, about issues important to them, and we'll hear some more uh, yeah. after this conversation. Uh, Health care, immigration, gun reform, uh, gun right. safety control, very important to them. Also, a lot of conversation, as we just heard, about the rise of white supremacy in yeah. this country mm -hmm. right now, sure. racism, uh, minority communities feeling under pressure and really mm -hmm. looking to a new leader yeah. to help us out of that. What, what do you you make of the of the climate right now uh, when it comes to race in this country and what do you think we need well you know I think we need um, some understanding uh, and I think we need some empathy uh, on both sides and I think uh, we need to have the ability to work together uh, and do it in a way that's going to benefit um, our communities and, and our state and our, our, our world. Uh, and for our students to have this kind of experience, to hear it up close and personal and hear really a couple of sides uh, is very important as they go off to, to become who they're going to become. And they can help that uh, change. They can help change the world. Dr. Lane, we'll see you tonight. Thanks yeah, for having us tonight. here. Yeah, Thank so you all very much. To Thank you, you. so Thanks much. Thanks so much Go for coming on. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Go Tigers. You heard that. All right. So before we um, move on to the next thing, Devin, I just want to ask you, you know, you are also hosting the briefing room later. That's right. Then you're going to be part of the debate coverage tonight. That's so just right. tell us a little bit about that before we move on. Yeah, we hope everybody can tune in tonight uh, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern time here on ABC News Live. Of course, you can watch us on Hulu Live, uh, Facebook Watch, Roku, uh, there it is. Coverage begins at 7. We're carried uh, about an hour pre-show from our full political team, what to expect tonight. Then we'll have three hours uh, of debate and analysis and then continue with the candidates in the spin room yes. uh, after the show. So a lot of action continuing on uh, and it will be very exciting. So I hope everybody tunes in. Awesome. And there are going to be some people tuning in because there's a bunch of watch parties going on. Um, right. Students here at Texas Southern are excited about the debates tonight, as you can imagine. And there are a few watch parties on campus. So I want to go to Brianna Stewart, who's at the studio. Student Center. Uh, Brianna, hi, good to see you. Um, what are some of the things hey that there. the How students are, are talking good about? To see you. Good, good to see you too. Well, you know, um, what are some of the things? <laughs> I was cutting you off. You yes. can carry on. We're <laughs> live. It happens. <laughs> Yes. So um, even on my way over here, I was talking to some students who were saying that they're really excited to hear about student debt, uh, but also about health care. That's also a big issue here for a lot of Texans who are uninsured. This state actually has the most uh, uninsured Americans in the country, a little over 4 million people. Um, and even yesterday, I uh, went to a press conference with the Texas Democratic Party and the Committee to Protect uh, Medicare and Affordable Care, and they are also looking to hear the health care debate tonight. Um, doctors saying that they're hoping that candidates will really distinguish their arguments and put patients and Americans at the center of the issue. And you are working the uh, debate watch party circuit again tonight, Brianna. I know you've been doing that uh, at all the, the debates so far this season. Uh, you got that lucky assignment. Who's going to be at this watch party tonight? And, and more importantly, Kimberly wants to know what they're going to be eating. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, so right after our one-on-ones in the, in the spin room after the debates, there's going to be a midnight rally starting at 11 p.m. Central, 12 a.m. Eastern. Booker has already confirmed, uh, Julian Castro has already confirmed. The Texas Democratic Party says that there will be about four to five candidates, but so many people will be swinging in and out with top Democrats and voters who want to engage with Democrats here um, and possibly turn Texas blue uh, in 2020. All right. Brianna Stewart right there on the campus. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, Devin, are you excited? I'm really excited. Like how excited? I'm stoked. <laughs> it's going to be I'm a great night. ready for some brisket. I need a couple of tacos. <laughs> I'll save the drinks for later. I'm very excited about tonight's coverage. Yeah, an all-day event. Um, amazing here to be here in Houston leading up to this. Um, Ten candidates tonight, one night only. And it is one night only, half the field. you got to catch this. Could be a turning point in the race. And I will put in a little humble plug uh, for the briefing room this afternoon, 3.30 Eastern time. We've got a packed show for you, uh, one-hour special edition from here. Kimberly will be on her way back uh, to New York at that time to yes. catch us tomorrow. But we've got some incredible stories uh, in the briefing room this afternoon, Kimberly. We took a road trip uh, to uh, some of the critical purple counties outside of Houston here. This city is rapidly changing demographically. It's scrambling the politics of this state, as Brianna just mentioned, helping to start to turn it blue uh, in many areas. We hear from some of those voters. We also stop at a gun range in okay. this town to hear about the gun debate and why the, uh, the, the state is talking about background checks again. And finally, uh, the most special piece, I think, for me of this entire trip has been the honor of meeting the head debate coach at Texas Southern University, wow. Dr. Thomas Friedman. He's taught here for 70 years. He still comes to work. He's 100 years old. Uh, and we have his tips for the candidates tonight on how to be a successful debater. So you have to tune in for that. Unbelievable. So guys, um, thank you for tuning in right here live in Houston. So much going on. It's looking beautiful. <laughs> I'm with Devin. We're feeling good. So continue to watch ABC News Live all day. And thanks for tuning in right now. We'll see you later.